So uh, I cannot see the joinees, but um, it's really good to have you with us here today. Um, welcome to a webinar that we we'll be talking to you all about how we can untangle the carbon complexities of the video gaming industry. We have been spending probably 12 months working on this project. Uh, my name is Sam Barrett. I work for UN Environment and I'm the Chief of Youth Education and Advocacy. Um, first of all, thank you for tuning in, uh, whether you're in person with us now or watching the recording. It's great to have you here. Uh, I also work with a number of colleagues to facilitate Playing for the Planet, which is an initiative with the video games industry that's supporting them to do two things. Number one, to decarbonize, and number two, to think about placing green activations in games. And today we're going to be talking all about uh, decarbonization. And also tomorrow, we should be sharing with you more on what the Green Game Jam for 2024 will look like. So I think what we're going to try and do on this call is to really go through three things. One is to share with you the main findings of the paper. And Matt Anderson's with us here to talk all about that. You're going to listen from studios that are acting on this already to hear from them what they're doing, what you could do more of. Um, and also to start to begin a conversation about how collectively we consider what we can do to move fast on this. We need to decarbonize five times quicker than we needed to 20 years ago. And so pace is everything. Um, and so what we're looking to do in this is get practical and get specific around what you can do to make the greatest difference. Um, we've used the word untangle in this, and I, I think that's a good word because um, I think to entangle something, it requires patience. It requires you to look at the problem and see where it's coming from. And it's very tempting just to start pulling at stuff to feel like you're getting things going. But I think untangling is a way of just really looking at the problem carefully, holistically, and working out where you begin. And on this project, we've spent 12 months working out how do we begin to untangle this? And what we've looked to try to do is generate consensus with the industry so people are sharing their understanding about what they can do and also to align it to the greenhouse gas protocol so that what we're doing is adhering to uh, the common global standards of what people should be doing. We also wanted to work with people both inside and outside of the, the initiative of Playing for the Planet. So both Yuki and Video Games Europe have been helping bridge out to other parts of the, the industry to get their perspectives on this. And we also wanted to think about what can gamers do? Um, sometimes it's very much a, a B2B initiative in Playing for the Planet, but we've also come up with some guidelines for what gamers can do, because uh, we can all play our part. And I think off the back of this, the idea is to support the industry to come up with a shared methodology so that accountancy is done uh, the same for everyone. And then this would, in theory, inform how calculators can be done uh, with consistency across the across the piece. And we've also started to think about what are the enabling factors that we need to do more of to support studios? And what are the disabling factors we need to get rid of to support progress on this as soon as possible? I want to acknowledge and say thank you to a few people on this. The first is to Unity, who've kind of supported the, the, the paper with, with funding. So with Jessica and with Charles um, and Marina, who's no longer there, but a big part of this. Thank you for your support. But also to Yuki for being a big host and supporter of us getting this far. And also to Matt from Carbon Trust, who I'm about to hand over to. So when you're listening to this call, we're going to try and be jargon light as much as possible. But if there's anything you don't understand, use the chat and we can circle back. And I often think in these kind of conversation, everyone pretends to be the expert uh, and perhaps no one ever really is. And so I think just assume that we're friends having a conversation and do not assume that we know everything. And it's the questions that you ask that will help us to get to the wisdom that we need. So really, this is a safe space where there's no such thing as a silly question. Uh, all questions are good questions. And what we're going to try and do over the course of this next 54 minutes is to share some insight with you, but have a space whereby uh, you can hear from uh, the people with us uh, about what they've been doing. And we can also hear from you as well. So I'm going to hand over now to Matt to introduce the findings of the report and to share with you uh, what we've discovered so far. So over to you, Matt. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Um, and hi, everyone. It's really good to see we've got 58 participants, so definitely a lot of interest in this topic. Um, and we've got some good discussion coming up after I, I give you a summary of the report. Um, so I'll just introduce myself quickly. My name is Matt Anderson. I work at the Carbon Trust. Uh, I'm a senior consultant in our ICT team where I'm the technical lead. Um, and the Carbon Trust is a consultancy uh, who focuses on accelerating the move to net zero. And we have 20 years of experience in 
the climate space. Um, I'm also the lead author for this report, Untangling the Carbon Complexities of the Video Gaming Industry, um, and really looking forward to talking through the, the summary of the report and the main findings. Um, you just got a preview of the um, cover of the report, which looks awesome. Um, I, I wanted to also thank a few folks uh, before I dive in. So first of all, Sam and Lisa from the Playing for the Planet team, who've done an awesome job of um, taking this initiative forward um, and giving it the momentum it needs to get to the point it is today. Uh, also, Dan and the Yuki team uh, for their support throughout um, the report writing process. Um, the Playing for the Planet members who contributed to the report and uh, gave their insight and expertise into a really important topic. Um, and we couldn't have done it without their support. And then uh, from the Carbon Trust, Luisa Diaz Flores and Mary Carla Medina from my team for all of their contributions to developing content for the report. So a big thanks all around. Um, and one more thing I'll say before I get started, I think it's been a really great privilege for me to work on this report over the last 12 months. Uh, as a gamer myself, I, I actually personally have a lot of hope in seeing the momentum and enthusiasm that the industry has on taking climate action and also the potential that games have to inspire a generation of players on moving things forward on climate. Um, so with that said, I'll jump right in So the next slide, please, Louisa, unless I have control, maybe I do. You should have control now. Uh, I have tried to give you control uh, of my screen there. There we go, okay. Um, all right, so first things first, just wanted to share with you what's actually in the report. So we had two main objectives uh, when writing this report. Uh, the first was to engage with players on climate and the other was to empower businesses on their own climate action journey um, and give them the resources necessary uh, to continue to take uh, more action. So we've split the report into four chapters. Uh, the first two are more public facing. Uh, the first chapter covers uh, broadly the current state of climate action in the industry, as well as um, summarizing the progress barriers and the path forward to accelerate impact. The second chapter acts as a primer on climate change and video games for players. It's really written for and to players uh, to give good information and good resources on climate uh, and how that relates to video games, as well as including some helpful tips and tricks for players interested in taking climate action. Uh, chapter three is technical guidance uh, and specific examples for video game businesses on interpreting and implying uh, scope three carbon emissions accounting and reporting frameworks. Um, that sounds very jargony, but essentially what we aim to do here was give video game businesses um, best practice examples um, and support in their own carbon footprinting as it relates to scope three. And then chapter four is frequently asked questions on climate action in video games. Bear with me, I'm just trying to sort out how this works. I think I've got it now. Um, so just wanted to quickly at a glance, give you a sense of what's in chapter two of the report. And really, like I mentioned, it's a primer on carbon in video games made for players. Uh, the aim here was to provide easy to understand, tailored information for players on climate and climate action, and to open the conversation with the community with the aim of getting them involved. You can see some examples of the information presented within this uh, chapter of the report. Um, I highly recommend reading through it. I think there's a lot of good information there from a variety of sources, uh, and it does act as a, a really good primer on this subject. And just on the right-hand side, you'll see um, the practical tips and tricks for players who want to master climate action. That's part of this chapter. We present 10 tips and tricks. So moving on to the scope three focus of the report, uh, which I know many of you joining today are interested in. Um, so I've just asked the question here, does it matter about aligning to the greenhouse gas protocol? And my answer to that is definitely yes. And we recommend doing so. Um, and the reasons are that climate change is on the global agenda. I think next week we have COP28 coming up. Um, 
climate and climate action will take the global spotlight for uh, a couple of weeks this year. Um, it's on the political agenda. It's on consumers' agenda. Um, it's not going anywhere, and this is a really important topic. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing that customers, uh, regulators, and the general public are expecting more action on climate. Um, so what can businesses do? Well, first of all, they can start measuring their emissions, and the greenhouse gas protocol is the de facto carbon accounting framework for doing that. Um, it's the framework that underpins the science-based targets initiative, and it's compatible with uh, virtually all um, reporting requirements at the national level. And good carbon accounting also presents opportunity uh, for your business. Um, it's a tool to engage with your teams internally, um, to track progress, and to set your strategy on climate. Um, and in taking good climate action, you'll naturally attract um, talent from across the industry who's interested in, in joining organizations who are uh, focused on this task. So this is a busy illustration and it's something that you can find in the report and dive into uh, with a little bit more focus. But what I wanted to uh, call to your attention with this illustration really is just how complex scope three emissions are. Uh, but really what they represent are the emissions that are upstream and downstream of your own business's operations. Um, and this illustration gives you a video game developer's perspective on how emissions relate to the full life cycle of video games. Um, so when we're talking about scope three emissions uh, in the life cycle of a video game, it's things like uh, the data center services required to run the game, uh, the network services required, um, advertising, it's office equipment and computers needed to develop the game. Um, and it's also energy required to play the games themselves. Um, within the report, we try to break this down into a more digestible uh, view of how scope three missions relate to uh, your business and the value chain. Uh, but I think here you, you can start to get a flavor for uh, the complexity. So with that being said, um, scope three emissions are daunting, but we undertook um, an effort to review published footprints from video game businesses and try to identify any trends from those types of businesses. And generally across the report, we look across publishers, developers, and hardware manufacturers. Uh, what we found in doing this was one, that there is variation in how businesses are reporting their scope three emissions. And so there's opportunity um, to clean that up and head towards um, a more consistent reporting approach across the industry. Um, but we also recognize that narrowing your focus is going to help in a couple ways. One, it will just um, help you in your data collection effort and the amount of resources that goes into generating a footprint. But then it will also guide your, your climate action strategy uh, when you start to think about how you can reduce emissions across your business. The two key categories that we found to have high relevance to video game businesses are category one, purchase goods and services, and category 11, use of sold products. Um, you can see in this temperature chart, there's some other categories as well, like capital goods, and, it, and for some smaller studios and developers, business travel pops up as a relevant category. Uh, so it's not that the others should be disregarded, but when you're thinking of where, where to devote your um, resources to this effort, uh, we suggest focusing on the most material categories. And another observation and recommendation is that transparency and consistency uh, go a long way. So we suggest being um, transparent with your methods, your data sources, any categories you exclude, um, and also to report with consistency. Um, the idea for that is as you're tracking progress and communicating progress against any targets you may have set uh, for your own business on reducing emissions, you want to be able to represent um, emission reductions from action that you've taken rather than representing variation in uh, calculation methodologies or data sources. Um, within the report, we provide um, an example, which you're looking at part of it here, uh, but we also provide an example of a methodology statement uh, that does a good job of transparently documenting 
the methods and sources and exclusions uh, within a, a scope three footprint. So I talked about category 11 use of sold products as being um, important. And one thing we found in writing this report and interacting with the various members of the Alliance who contributed to it is that um, thinking about emissions for video game software is complicated and there's not necessarily a clear answer on how to account for these emissions. So we recognize that it is an evolving space uh, and we suggest applying the relevancy principle to determine how to treat these emissions. Um, within the report, this goes into much more detail, but it boils down to um, taking the view of your level of influence on the use phase emissions from video game software. So how much can you actually influence the energy consumed uh, to operate your game? And also size. So when you do estimate these emissions, are they significant within the, the full picture of your business's footprint? Um, and if the answer to both of those is that you do have influence and they are significant in size, we recommend accounting for these emissions uh, from the use of video game software. So we covered quite a bit of ground in the report. Um, I've only give you, given you a small selection of the findings and recommendations. You'll find much more detail and more examples within the report, uh, but we weren't able to solve every challenge and we recognize that there's still more to be done. Uh, and playing for the planet, I know, is up to the task of taking some of these forward. But just to highlight a few areas uh, where we see uh, the next steps on climate action being within the industry. One is exploring um, alternative um, approaches and improvements to estimating use phase emissions, uh, including improving the accuracy and reliability of these calculations by using real world data. Um, advertising is another area where we know um, many video game businesses have taken an initial view of their footprint and advertising has, has cropped up. Um, so we recommend engaging with advertising partners to gain a clear picture of the emissions from advertising uh, and exploring the opportunities to reduce those emissions going into the future. And then finally, um, we also recognize that video game engines um, have a tremendous opportunity just through their, their breadth of exposure to the industry to perform a custodial role in reducing emissions of video games and video game development. Uh, so we suggest exploring that role that engines could play in the future of climate action in the industry. Um, where I will leave it is a link to the report. Uh, you can find it on playingfortheplanet.org slash project slash carbon dash complexities dash report. I highly suggest you go read it. Um, there's a lot of great information in there and I think you'll find it very useful as you start to dive into scope three footprinting. And I also encourage you to share it with your community of players uh, and people you know who are interested in uh, video games and climate. Uh, and that's it for me. So I'll pass it back to Sam, thank you. We think the paper is useful just to try and break down the complexity and also the simplicity of the two areas where the greatest uh, burden of emissions are, but also to really think about what not not just what needs to be counted, what but what needs to be done. So in this next part of the conversation, I, I do want to build on what Trista said in the chat, which is to ask your questions. Um, we are a very friendly, responsive group of people who, if anything, maybe overserve your needs rather than underserve your needs. So do feel uh, the opportunity to drop questions in there um, of all shapes and shapes and sizes. And I'm just going to kind of come now to introduce our eminent panel of people just to talk uh, with them around the progress they've been making on putting things into place, not just as thinkers, but also as doers in the industry. So uh, I'm going to start with Trista. Uh, Trista Patterson is the Director of Sustainability at Microsoft Xbox, recently included in the Time Magazine Climate 100, uh, has been working on this from day one, and she and I go way back on this journey, but also has been doing some really innovative thinking around how do uh, how could Xbox support those building games to get rid of emissions in the design phase rather than kind of deal with them when they're out in the real world? So some really smart thinking there that she and her team have been working on. 
next we've got Alina uh, Tinvela, and I hope I've done that okay. I did ask a, a Finnish colleague today to make sure I was all right, uh, who is the coordinator of Neo Games in Finland, who's also been developing a scope three tool herself. And so I think she's a, a hardcore practitioner that can talk about the journey of building uh, tools that work. And then also uh, Tommy uh, from Lapalainen. Uh, again, hope I've done okay there, Tommy, who's the Senior Sustainability Manager at Rovio Entertainment, has been spending a lot of time just looking at the common problems, particularly around the hotspots that they faced in mobile and what needs to be done to address those as well. So it's really great to have the three of you on the call. And I'm just going to ask one question to, to all of you to answer in order, um, maybe starting with Trista. But where are you at? Uh, not with just addressing carbon emissions, but acting to to deal with them. And is there something like one piece of insight you can offer to those kind of tuning in about where they should begin on this? So over to you, Trista, first. That's a great question, Sam, because there's so many, there's so much focus on the numbers. Everyone's curious about how to conceptualize the footprint of where they are either, or what they even have influence over. And that's a tough thing where sometimes you're placed in a large organization and you don't know how you can put your effort in order to create the most collective impact. So one thing I think about is this really broad spectrum. And it's important to um, put that, define both ends. On one hand, you need to define currently where you are, the amount of resources and knowledge that you have in the moment, and what is resonating with your leadership, with your peers, with your consumer base, with your gamers, that you really feel has existing traction to move the needle, given the resources you've got. And that can be a really practical, pragmatic thing. It takes lots of practice finding different ways to cast your arguments and speak to all of those different audiences in your near proximity, it, it takes time. On the other end of the spectrum, it is equally as important to speak about the vision of where it is you want to head and the things that even though deep down you suspect it's impossible to put words on the ideas and the futures and the reasons why and your excitement about it and to make it multi-sensory and engaging and something that you can both energize yourself and also in expression of that, you're energizing everyone else around you. The importance of keeping those two edges of the spectrum there is that on one hand, you're being pragmatic, real, you're able to show those quick wins with immediate returns in very, very practical, meaningful senses to those around you. And on the other hand, you're encouraging yourself and the others to think bigger, think broader, think outside of the existing resources that they know that they have at their disposal, because it's only through the networking, as we've been showing through playing of the pl playing for the planet, is that when everybody brings together their existing resources and talks about the identification of those common problems that you can only tackle together, then you can make that bigger lift and reach more toward the visioning end. So it's really important to be able to speak to the full range of both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, thanks, Trista. Um, and just to build on that, just about how you kind of... Um, Asking your argument so you can get people to do things. So maybe I'm just going to come to you, Alina. Um, what is the one piece of learning that you'd share with the people listening about the progress you've made or the challenges that you faced or something that you think is important to share? I think the one key learning, um, even though I have environmental science background myself, uh, when I jumped into this discussion about game industry and climate, climate, uh, climate change and emissions, it felt a little like a huge jungle, I mean, and what direction to take and what to do. So my key learning is just start navigating. Just find where you are somehow and start, go somewhere. You can't just stay there and ask for a lot of help. For example, as uh, Sam, you mentioned that we have been 
uh, creating um, source tree emission calculator and calculation tools. Uh, it was it was a tricky tricky road, and I couldn't have made any any of those successes there, even if I didn't ha ask any help. So I asked help for companies that have been doing this uh, earlier already. So what what should be do what should we be doing next, and what to do next, and what what to take into account here and there. So just start going somewhere and ask a lot of questions on the road. I think that was what I learned during during what I have been doing. Okay. Thanks, Alina. And the same question to you, Tommy. One piece of advice, practical wisdom for others to pick up and use. It could be kind of one key learning that I would focus on is that that prioritize. Uh, there are things that, that matter. Um, like if you think about, for example, reducing emissions or, or, or doing good for the environment, there are like, it's usually said that every action matters, but some actions matter more. So if you find that kind of a big chunk of emissions in, in your value chain, for example, and if you take 5% out of it, it might be much, much more than eliminating, for example, let's say, that you spend a lot of time and effort to move to a paperless company, although you are spending like five sheets a month. So prioritizing is, is really important and finding those hotspots and the kind of grab that Matt showed earlier on, on the kind of the colored dots is a good rule of thumb tool to find those hotspots. Thanks, Tommy. Um, and then maybe just to jump into a bit more of a specific question for you then, Trista, which is, it's one thing to measure your footprint. There's another thing to act on it um, because that's where it gets harder potentially. Um, and when you look at the scope three footprint of, of Xbox, um, what are the biggest opportunities that you found uh, to start to take meaningful action and to maybe prioritize some of the toughest nuts? So what are you, how are you taking on this challenge internally where you are? I think a really important rule of thumb for everyone, regardless of how big or small the company they're in, is to gauge each opportunity in front of you, not only with a more quantitative understanding about the opportunity, the immediate opportunity itself, mm. but then a long view of what else you could do to make that opportunity scale. So that is to say, if you're taking time to take a look at your organization's footprint, can you empower not only yourself, but a whole network of people across your organization to take action on that? That's what will make, that's what will broaden the collective envelope of your impact. So without those two um, perspectives, not only your understanding of how to create movement, but also how to trigger the movement of others, you'll have you'll over index on your immediate experience. And it's really important to broaden out from that, considering the long arc of time, the momentum between but in different areas of the system, the growing consumer base, even if you don't think that currently there's market traction, or maybe your market or, or leadership is telling you that that gamers are not responding right now. We know that climate is is creating much more urgency in the gaming consumer base and all of the world events and things happening around people's daily lives will make so many of these issues more and more acute and permanent and and pertinent including energy bills, the kinds of emissions that organizations create responsible company and consumer behavior and so on. So um, looking beyond immediate experience to those places where you can trigger kind of catalytic action is a really important perspective. Thanks, Trista. And just maybe just as a follow up on that, just on the um, the developer toolkit that you developed, um, did you do that because you were asked to do that from the, the the studios that you were serving or because you thought it'd be useful for the, the studios to use? And, and can you give us a sense of what difference you think that will make? I think the toolkit was uh, developed for precisely that purpose because there were inquiries coming in from developers. Oh, well, this information is great, but 
what are we going to do about it? Or asking for advice of um, how many offsets should we buy? Or what kind of offset should be purchased? And that's that's a one-off. That's an answer that you have to give every single year. And then also make a gamble that those offsets are actually going to create that benefit or that the carbon's going to stay removed for a long period of time. It's a huge risk to take. Yet, if we can empower each individual, the toolkit was created because in response to a one-off question, we felt that we could inform individuals in real time about the changes that they could make as they were developing game code. And so to learn the principles, to be able to get that real-time visual feedback, and then also create a platform by which in the future people could learn about the frontier of improvements and continue to evolve their game development experience as the tooling and the responsiveness of the system evolves. So that was the reasoning behind the development. Okay, great, thanks, Trista. And so maybe Trista, just dropping anything on the developer toolkit into the chat would be helpful so people can learn more about that. Uh, there's been a couple of really good discussions I know you've shared there, but but Tommy, just on the the issue that you've come across on the Gremlins in um, category one and 11, when it comes to Marcom's budget, um, getting more users to play your game is a critical part of the business. Um, but with that comes kind of uh, carbon consequences as well. So how have you kind of managed that tension there uh, to try and address it? Yeah, it's a tricky part. Like, like, <laughs> As many of you probably know, we are mobile games developer, and and mainly we are doing software. So so this is like an interesting point for us because we are we have like a good relationship with with the device manufacturers. We have good relationship with our players. We have good relationship with the Google and Apple who are serving the the app stores as well. But our kind of influence is more like indirect in 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 this kind of spectrum. And when when we look at like on our emission categories might show some some good examples previously but like when we look at our our kind of hotspots for emissions as a mobile games developer uh we see that purchased purchase goods and services and and here the user acquisition what we call also marketing is the dominating in that space and this is actually where we need to kind of be really kind of selecting our partners properly so that we do marketing and, and user acquisition and and the, all the millions of hours of videos played when when we do do our marketing that we serve our players with with the proper partners that have invested in renewable energy and and the likes of that so that we can then manage this kind of an emission category what we have in our scope three value chain which is indirect to us but important because we want to recognize all all the emissions that we are creating within our value chain. Other, other big factor is use of hot products. So meaning that when you play, let's say you play Angry Birds Dream Blast, we know that how many hours our, our total players play on an annual basis. So then we can count that kind of uh, emissions from that. And although mobile devices are really energy efficient, uh, when you multiply that with millions of players and millions of hours, it becomes a quite important chunk of, of emissions. So, for example, the kind of use of solid products, uh, when we combine that also with the YouTube viewers devices, this accounts for 40% of our total emissions. So this is where we come to an important kind of point, what we are doing in the future, that, that how could we collaborate with the, uh, with the device manufacturers? How could we collaborate with the uh, game engine developers that we could improve the performance of our software? so that we know where to optimize because that's something that's also an accessibility thing that that not everybody has the privilege of, of un, unlimited data and, and unlimited energy and stuff like that so it's a really important thing and that's something where we are heading for the future and i i, I really salute tristan and the team to deliver, deliver delivering the xbox toolkits for the developers this is something that we also would like to see in the mobile space and just to follow up on that, Tommy, um, if you were to make a request of those in the mobile space, um, what are the one or two things specifically you'd be looking for from them? 
I think that like from the device manufacturers uh, and and also from the game engine side, is that if we could have like a really precise metrics to our hands on like let's say we optimize this solution, uh, if we could turn that and quantify that into kilowatt hours of energy consumption, that would be a great great kind of win for us. Then we could quantify the actual impact what we are generating. Because like when you're making business decisions, it's not like it's not super good to make decisions based on on kind of really rough assumptions. So you need to put then resources, time, effort to optimize your software. And if you don't know what will the end result be, probably my CFO will say that hey, this is probably not super optimal use of our time and money. Mm. So if we could quantify that, that would make a huge difference. Then we could easily justify our actions. Okay. Thanks, Tommy. And just to say for those on the call, there is a, a discussion around what is it that could engines do, but then also what is it the platforms could do to really support studios to make the best decision possible uh, as opposed to doing what they're doing at the moment, which is a huge amount of arithmetic to work out what's really happening. So I think there's a lot of efficiency that could be supported by platforms and, and engines to help um, more efficient ways of establishing the carbon consequence of play, uh, which hopefully we'll be following up with further discussions. Um, Alina, so uh, I've never made a scope three calculator. Um, I'm not sure many people on the call have made a scope three calculator. Uh, I could be wrong there. But what have you discovered in your journey um, you mentioned at the beginning um, about asking around for support. Um, and so I'd be interested to get a sense from you about um, how do you get the balance right between measuring the carbon contribution of play versus also giving guidance about what you should do once you understand what the carbon cost is through games. So how do you get that tension right? Because you can go into this rabbit hole of just counting emissions for, for months, weeks, years, um, but at some point you need to come out and do something about it. So how have you thought about that? Well, for us, uh, first we created a calculation model and it was very largely based on, on the company models that there is in Finland. So basically Rovio and Supercell have been doing a great job there before. We launched Finnish Game Industry model, model for CO2 calculations. And after we had that model, uh, we, of course, had at that point to companies who had some kind of idea, well, not some kind of great idea, what is the sources of their emissions. And when we had the model, we started asking a couple more companies to start calculating in our model to see if there are some, some echoing going on. Is the players a big part on this company and this company on their emissions? So we got kind of hint that, okay, we are on the right track there. What is the important sources of emissions if you don't want to start calculating everything? Because I think many companies don't want to start with everything, everything, but start with the things that matter and and also start somewhere because, because it's easier to start with one or two things than, than 10 things. And when we had that test run with the calculation model, we also did some updates to the model. But we also noted that the model itself, it was it was navigatable, but you needed time to time to actually start figuring out with just just a PDF file. And also we had at that point great uh, Google Docs uh, Excel sheet there. But anyway, it took a lot of time and effort, and we started to think that, okay, not many companies have this much time to bring if they are focusing on their project. They have to have a game to launch or something else going on, limited resources. So we have now a CO2 calculator on open beta testing phase. Uh, both this calculation model and calculator are not completely greenhouse gas protocol compliant. So I'm very happy to have this untangling report that I can check more information. How could I make make things better in our our resources? But I would say they think they give you idea what are the things to start start asking yourselves when starting to do the calculations. So it's it's a resource to, that might help 
might help, and I hope it helps. And at this in open beta testing phase, we are hoping to test it better, test it more and better, and do do things things more correctly so that it's usable for also smaller companies. Great, thanks, Alina. Um, I'm sure there's a lot we can learn from you. Um, and just maybe a question for all of you. I'm going to come to you, Trista, which is. Looking at the wider recommendations in the paper, there's so many things that you could choose to spend your time on, which is better tools and more support from platforms and engines, um, getting gamers involved. So there's some grassroots demand for, from studios to maybe do a bit more than they're currently doing. Maybe the tool of regulation. Um, what is it that you think would be the strongest driver to move the industry forward fastest out of all the different things you could do? So What's in your wisdom on on what would help accelerate progress, Trista? I'm really interested in all of our companies coming together to share and invest in different facets of consumer research. Because we all have a sense that deep down there is an underlying concern in the consumer base we know that this is growing. We know that the impacted audiences and gamers worldwide are being affected by so many different elements of climate and energy disruption, as well as bandwidth scarcity. And yet our marketers are not um, deeply experienced with understanding the nuances to identifying how to tap into the value um creation for the consumer that easily makes it identifiable to gamers how these innovations, the investments, different um, device attributes or materials used can benefit them or benefit the world around them or benefit the planet as a consequence of their immediate consumer choices. And that's true of whether or not they're familiar with um a device, for example, alerting them. Did you know that you have access to a renewable energy system that you could you could be running on renewable power in your home? Or did you know that this device was created with recycled marine plastic? Or did you know that no longer do you need to use disposable batteries? You can now use a reusable, rechargeable battery pack. Or did you know that you can create a setting, you can tick a setting on one of your devices that will slash your standby energy consumption by 95%. There are subtle, subtle word differences in the very scarce communication real estate in the game development interface. And those that work in that space, they have lots of things that they can change, whether it's color or movement or when in the choice architecture that information appears. But those people are not deeply familiar with the gently nuanced sustainability language that must also be joined with behavioral psychology. So what parts of the brain light up in the consumer mind in order to trigger action. So when you bring those three together, then you've got the dynamite. The problem is each one of us located across our companies all have bits and pieces and different individual gifted individuals in our, in our workforce that have the capacity or even 10% of their discretionary time to pick away at a certain portion of the question. If we join this together, we will have a much more coherent recipe. And also we will be able to show, also for everybody on this web webinar, why investments for you listening about this will make sense to your leadership to be able to invest in and why that creates business value and return. Thanks, Trista. So climate smart, gameplay uh, with a strong dose of behavioral insights to harness people to think differently about what we're currently serving up is a very crude summary of what I think you've just said. Including that really precise market research mm. to get to understand the language that's resonating with gamers where they are in the moment that they are making decisions. It's, mm. it's a marketing piece that is, um, it's so subtle. And yet those that have 
that marketing gift and in the communication side oftentimes are not deeply connected with the opportunities in the gaming sustainability space and are are also not um, deeply familiar with the subtle changes in greening wording or sustainability wording that can make all the difference in whether or not consumers respond to an available option. Mm. Okay, thanks, Trista. I know we've got Katie on the call who's done a lot of thinking on this, and Tom's asked a question about the work that universities can play in supporting this. We might come back to that as a question in the back end of the call. Um, thanks, Trista. That was great. So, just maybe I'm just going to spin that over to Tommy just to ask the same question, which is what could be, out of all the different drivers, what would move the industry forward fastest, if that made sense? Yeah, I think. I would like to tap on the kind of what Trista already said and what we discussed about the kind of behavior and, and the kind of consumer needs is that it's often, I've, I've been with Rovio for, for more than nine years. So I've seen a quite a change in the whole industry when it comes to sustainability. And and the kind of gaming industry used to be an industry where, where you think that, hey, this is digital. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's not, we don't have that waste. But quite quickly we realized that, that, hey, digital is has also a kind of emission footprint and, and it's important to kind of manage that. And also, when we have been kind of on the, let's say, last five years, it has been a big realization in the industry that, hey, we need to kind of develop more energy efficiencies uh, within within that kind of industry. And and, and especially on the mobile game side, it's, it's considered as this kind of a young industry. Mm. Uh, I think that we haven't fully realized also that like when we haven't realized the importance to us as a developer, uh, I think that it's really hard to also realize that that hey, consumer behavior might we might be triggering bigger things here. Uh, so it comes to a realization that we need to take it on our own hands first, and then we probably can trigger also the kind of consumer behavior and then drive the change through that. And I would like to raise the kind of importance of, of awareness creation uh when it especially when it comes to mobile game side uh we are raising millions of millions of players uh within the industry and and especially with the free to play model you can come into a play and and pay nothing uh which is a bit different than, than in pc and console and and with the free to play you reach easily reach huge masses of people and then whatever you do in the game create those screen notches, raise awareness of important environmental causes. And I raised on the chat that that Green Game Jam is, for example, is, is a really good example of that. Mm -hmm. Is that we can really use the millions of eyeballs within our games and we can drive that good good message throughout a much bigger audience that we would ever reach uh, when we just look inside our organization. Great, thanks, Tommy. Um... And just to build on that, I was just trying to find a link to the research of 390,000 gamers that I think we did a couple of years ago with a number of studios, including Rovio, that showed that actually there's a high appetite from gamers for some of this content, as long as it's true to the nature of the game and as long as it's true to um, the game mechanics as well. So I think there are opportunities in there to be explored further and more research is needed. Um, Alina, I might give you a difficult question. I hope you don't mind. Uh, but I know JP often raises this around the role of regulation, and particularly with the European Union looking quite closely at this. We're seeing the introduction of uh, carbon taxes, and we're seeing a lot more um, requirements being placed on companies to incentivize the right thing from uh, from <laughs> being, you know, happening in the world. So what is your take on the role of regulation? Is that moving businesses faster? What do you? What is your opinion? That's the last question. Is it moving business faster? Is very <laughs> very hard. I think regulation plays a key role in in many cases. Uh, um, in regulation point of view, I think it is for game industry point of view and scope three emissions. Uh, it is important for from my point of view that EU has a kind of a ambition in this level in green energy and so on. Because if there was more green energy leadership there, maybe more green energy in the world, less emissions from the players. This is very kind of straightforward thinking in my head, I know it, but but anyway, it's important that in that point of view that there is 
a lot of ambition in EU level and hoping hoping that it, that will deliver worldwide more ambition. Um, I think that the regulations they of course when they are enforced they they have to be followed. So of course they are moving the businesses. And when it comes to moving businesses in this, uh, in the direction of being more um, sustainable, sustainable, I think it's also important that there are tools that companies can use. Mm-hmm. And of course, some EU regulations are are uh, enforcing bigger companies that might have more resources, both both monetary and mainly hum- human resources, to do do different stints, reporting, and so on, finding ways. But anyway, I think it's important that when there's regulation, there is also that regulation wouldn't ask impossibilities. That yeah. there there should be kind of resources that companies can actually, actually not maybe from EU, but already somewhere there existing that companies don't have to make the impossible possible in just few years or months, but they have something to something to something to use to when they are trying to do the do the right thing. I think the legislation is important and needed, but of course it's hard to hard to see in some cases is this a lot of, a lot to ask or is, is this good amount to ask from from the companies at the moment. Okay. If, if I continue there it's, it's like important to realize that when it comes with the kind of international regulation is that, that the bigger companies are at the pinpoint at first. But it's slowly and steadily coming to smaller companies as well. So in the future years, you, you'll be sure that at, at some point of time, you'll need to report something on, on the emissions or at least how you're planning to reduce it. So better be, be, be prepared if you are planning to grow. Yeah, Sorry. and it was already, of course, before it's in binding legislation, some some countries might see the hints from the EU that, okay, this is something we might want to enforce on our national funding systems or so on. So this is also a way it comes to the smaller companies already yeah. before it's very much enforced. True. Okay, so watch this space on that front. Um just with an eye on the clock, um, Trista, just on the research question, I think there's an interesting opportunity there for academia to really help studios to really understand what are the opportunities to um, test uh, with kind of academic uh, rigor about the opportunities in play. Do you, do you have like one minute on that briefly before I, I move to the final quest- question? Yeah, um, I just recently heard that there was a wonderful new grant uh sponsored by european union the horizon project that is releasing and just coming out so i'm really excited about that empowering game developers and students from and perspectives from academia on that um there's always been a wonderful dialogue going back and forth between the industry and academic researchers so the rigor of academia has always pushed frontiers on certain items um and that it is a back and forth because sometimes academia can also focus on what is apparent from the surface of the industry. So one area that I'll highlight that is strongly deserving of academic research is this the area of compression and the evolving technology to deliver compression to different devices upon which gamers game. So apps, for example, can and new technology supporting apps. There was the recent release of AV1, for example, that increases emissions in app mode, sometimes up to 30%. And we are still understanding whether or not that creates a tangible benefit for the consumer. So, So for academia to dig into the question of app development, compression, what is the frontier of that compression, and how does the ecosystem of all of the different companies that come together to provide entertainment options on gaming devices, how can we enable change there? That is one uncracked nut that we would really welcome academic research and rigor to. Yeah. 
Thanks, Tristan. And I think there is an emerging community of practice in academia, Tom, just to your point, that is thinking on this. There's about five or six universities that we're starting to kind of see what collectively they can work on together. So it's a community of practice as well. OK, so we are knocking on the door at the end of the call. Um, so I just want to ask all of you a question, which is in a year's time, um, where should we be? What would signify progress? Um, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think about that. Uh, and I'll pick on one of you first. I'll, I might even start with Matt um, from the Carbon Trust. You come in first, Matt, if you don't mind. One year's time, what would success look like from you? Okay, it took me three times to hit unmute. Um, so being a relatively new joiner to uh, this group of, of businesses and, and this industry, um, and with an outsider's perspective, you know, I think the industry has come a long way in a short period of time already. Um, but if I look across to some other industries that I work in, like telecommunications and um and that area, especially in the in the in the target setting space, um, I would hope that the the video gaming industry could have tackled the, the footprinting side of the equation at least to the basic level to move things forward, um, have targets set, and then businesses really start to be digging into what is the climate action strategy that they need to start acting on as they look ahead to 2030. I think in one year's time, if that's the conversation that we're having uh, at a webinar like this, rather than talking about footprinting, uh, then that would be a really good measure of progress. Thanks, man. Uh, Gauntlet laid. Um, so maybe, uh, Tommy, what would you say would be progress? I think that I would, I would focus uh, on the thing I said previously, that if we could quantify the kind of software optimization, if we could have, have those tools ready for us, that would be a kind of a great win for us. Right. Thanks, Tommy. Um, I'll go Tristan next. If I could have a wish, it would be for everyone listening to this call in one year's time to have hosted a Sustainafest for yourselves, because what is really most critical is the kind of communal energy and problem solving that comes together, like what Playing for the Planet has pulled together in order to be able to tackle more challenging problems and feel energized and feel positive about it. And it's amazing what you can do by buying a pizza and offering a few pieces to people that might be interested in working on things with you. So resources large or small throw throw a sustain a fest sometime in the coming year and bring people together with you um that's where i think the most the most action will be thanks Trista. alina that was so nice idea the sustain a fest i will go to the little more boring idea uh we talked about the game engines but i would love to see that other players from uh value chain also, not just engines, not just platforms, also marketing plat uh, service providers and everything else. There would be data available from them for big and small developers. And also that there would be good tools that bigger and smaller companies could easily use to calculate their emissions. I would think that would be great, great kind of development there. Great. Thanks, Alina. Okay, well, first of all, can I just say thank you for all of you that have tuned in. Um, also, a massive thanks to Matt and the Carbon Trust and for you, Keith, for doing all the hard work on the paper. Um, I'm going to say what Matt said, which is I really think it is worth reading. Uh, reports can be intimidating, but I think this one is pacey and you can flick through it and you'll learn a lot from it. But also a massive thanks to Alina, Trista and Tommy for joining the panel today. Um, I think we're all very keen to help. Um, and it's really good to have different industries on this call as well. I know there's been a few people from the music industry listening in. And there's all parts of the um, the, the games ecosystem uh, participating today. So thank you for joining. Um, I think we're all happy to drop our email addresses in there if you want to reach out. Um, but we're here as a community of practice to support big things happening. And it's through 
um, working as a collective that common solutions can be found to common problems. So thanks very much for taking part. Uh, Louisa, thank you for organising the call quietly from Yuki with all your colleagues. And uh, goodbye, good night, good morning, good evening. Um, thank you very much for joining the call. Thanks, Al.